Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 538. This is 538 of the Agostino Zynga show. I hope you're doing well wherever this podcast is meeting you. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what the deal is. Smash the flipping like button, headbutt that flipping subscribe and leave me a comment down below with your thoughts, feelings and suggestions and I'll do my best not to ignore them. If you're listening via the podcast app, specifically not pacifically specifically on the spotify app please leave me a 54321 star review any of those would really help in terms of getting me bumped up the little algorithm to get people to you know when you're searching someone's podcast and it comes you know you type in a couple of words and it suggests to you the name of the show maybe if you do that it will help in that regard i don't really know just let people know that you watch it regardless it's more of a vanity thing you know then it is an actual helpful kind of algorithmic thing but you know we try anyway and of course support for your patrons welcome to at patreon.com for slash agostino you can find a link to the patreon in the description of this podcast if you listen to it via the audio or if you're watching it via youtube it's patreon dot com my first name which is spelled a g o s t i n h o and on patreon all you need to do is subscribe for a dollar or a pound that's it a dollar a pound and you get access to all my bonus content of course there's higher tiers if you want to support the kid further but if you just want to access the bonus content which includes one bonus episode of this show per week so if you haven't had enough of me already providing all this free content here on youtube and you want to help out the kid behind the paywall then why not jump on board with the patreon this week's bonus episode is going to feature a documentary that i'm going to be watching about dash no so if you want to check that out or if you want to hear my review and hear some of my thoughts feelings and suggestions regarding that then definitely jump on board of the patreon we do bonus shows every week you know reviewing movies reviewing documentaries recommending tv series if you're kind of you know a little bit um doubtful of what to watch as well i can recommend those things on there too but definitely check out the patreon at patreon.com forward slash agostino patreon.com forward slash agostino spell a-g-o-s-t-i-n-h-o you can find the link in the description down below but yeah hope you are well i'm doing pretty fine day two or day three of the flipping the 75 hard program going all right you know how it is drinking tons of water pissing a lot that's the only thing that's annoying when you do a program or you do some sort of like yeah when you do some sort of workout regimen usually they're very specific about how much you should eat and how much you should drink and it's always a kind reminder that you not actually drink as much water as you think you do because i always say i drink a lot of water because for the most part when i'm at home i'm only either drinking um iced coffees which i make myself um tea and water right those are usually the things i'm drinking in terms of liquids i don't really have anything else i don't really have tons of alcohol at home even if i am drinking i don't have tons of alcohol I usually maybe have one bottle of whiskey which again i only drink usually on a weekend i don't really drink beer anymore because it doesn't really kind of upsets my stomach so that's the only thing that i really have right in that, in that regard so you think you drink a lot of water but then when a program tells you to drink a certain amount whether it's a liter or a gallon suddenly you realize oh i don't actually drink as much water as i thought i was drinking because you're required to drink that certain amount and god damn it man i am pissing every single minute or something man it's so annoying and if you know anything about me you'd know that i'm not really the biggest fan of like cacas and pps you know what i mean i don't really you know some people enjoy going to the toilet a lot i don't really enjoy it at all zero um, I, I kind of want to spend as little time as possible as I can in the toilet and you know for some whatever reason I'm having to you know urinate quite often Um, obviously the relief is pretty nice but in terms of just kind of constantly having to get up and go so god on my I can't sit down for an hour basically <laughs> without needing to go and piss but you know it's going to be for my health it's going to be for my good looks it's going to allow me to fit into all my slps and all my ricks and stuff for the coming you know party season so i'm all right with it it's a it's one of those things one of those little um sacrifices you have to make if you want to look good in clothes well it, the way i want to look anyway so not not too shabby apart from that i've got the finale of dexter um new blood downloaded but i haven't watched it yet um i think i might have the finale episode of station 11 too maybe the penultimate episode i'm not too sure that's a pretty decent new series um i downloaded narcos mexico i think season three the one starring bad bunny which is getting mixed reviews but i want to check that out 
I've got a few things, but I just haven't had the time to kind of sit down and watch them all because I've been busy, you know, working out, working and then coming back at home, reading. So my days are quite chock full with stuff to do, to be honest, which is nice. But, you know, it doesn't really allow for any much, any leisure time. So I'm probably going to have to catch up on all those things on my actual days off when I don't have anything. Um, so that's going to be what I'm going to do with that one. And of course, you know, watch the documentary about Dashno. Um, ahead of my bonus episode of the show that's going to be available on patreon so definitely check that out if you haven't already um quickly before we move on to anything else just want to say r.i.p to bob saget um this news kind of broke all over social media and stuff the last couple of days and yeah man it's been a bit of a tough one now because i'm a big fan of his and it's funny because i wasn't really a big fan of his and i didn't really know anything about full house or fuller house at all um, I mostly was a fan of his stand-up and obviously him being on podcast because, you know, I'm a bit of a fan of that whole LA podcast scene and he seemed to be one of the good eggs, right? He seemed to be like a Tom Papa type guy, like a Jim Caffigan type dude, a refreshing sort of, ant yeah, a, a, a refreshing kind of... Um, He's a he he was a refreshing beverage after listening to, you know, people like Burt Kreischer, you know, these adult babies, these men who have like refused to grow up and drink themselves blind silly every day and talk about the most obscene stuff at their grown age. It's always nice to have a comedian on who's generally funny and doesn't play the class clown, just as a funny bloke. And you got a lot of that from Bob Saga. He seemed really, really he seemed like the you know, people when they make it. And they're eternally grateful that they get given this chance to basically live out their dreams. And every day they want to somehow, in their own little way, give back a little light to people. Like, it's a really particular trait. Not everyone has it. Some people have a trait which is similar to Brendan Shaw, but it's like, no, I got here through my hard work and I deserve to be here. That's why people pay me. You know, that kind of, not entitlement, but it's a little, sort of like, um, it's this weird... I don't even say delusion, but everyone's got a different personality. It's not, it's not to say it's good or bad, but I just appreciate Bob Saget's personality and how he went about things because he was so refreshing from everybody else that I'd seen on that LA podcast scene who kind of seemed really wrapped up in themselves, um, kind of treated their fans as an afterthought or the audience as an afterthought, thought they kind of walked on water. And of course, some of them had to get brought down brought back down to earth through some really you know troubling accusations. But I thought Bob Saget was just a decent human. Again, don't know the guy personally but just from watching him on podcasts and again i think the recent one i watched him might have been joe rogan that was a recent jre and he was really really good on there um it was again refreshing too because you know the covid talk was um down to a bare minimum just talking the shit about industry stuff life you know funny stories and whatnot and um yeah he just seemed like a good dude i can't have anything more better to say about that it just seemed like a thoroughly thoroughly good dude then to pass away at 65 that's no good age man especially nowadays 65 is incredibly 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 young especially given his standing in life and the fact that he was you know I, i'd assume with the means to be able to um live a somewhat healthy stress-free quote-unquote life dying at 65 is just such a tragedy it really really is he has so much more to give i think he shared a couple of posts on instagram on twitter talking about how he was so happy and falling back in love with stand-up comedy again after being on tour performing for however long it was and again i saw that in real time i remember seeing that in real time and double tapping thinking oh that's pretty cool and i didn't think anything anything of it since then and randomly on the timeline you start seeing people posting pictures of somebody that you like and the first thing you think okay either they, something got announced that's amazing that they're going to do or usually they pass away. It's always it's, it's always macabre that, and it's really really upsetting, especially the person that you actually know their their content. You feel like you kind of know their personality a little bit. You've grown to kind of like them over a period of time. That's what happens, right? <clears throat> Listen to somebody in the podcast. You, you you kind of develop this weird parasocial relationship, but it kind of progresses over time. You might start off not liking them, then you might start liking them for a certain thing that they talk about. Maybe you might start liking a certain segment, but you learn to kind of. Um, um, include them in your daily or weekly rotations or podcasts that you listen to and it becomes a real link because sometimes when they don't upload on time you start you know fiending like just recently the other day tim dylan didn't upload the interview with joe rogan that he was meant to do on time and i was scratching like a little crackhead waiting for it to drop and i'm sure other fans were the same so to see this happening and to see his picture being shared everywhere bob saga you just knew just like oh man please let it be an announcement or some show he's doing or some reboot and then unfortunately no it was him um being dead at 65 years old so again r.i.p bob saga man absolute legend um let's quickly read off the article from tmz 
It says the following, Bob Saget has died at 65 years old. TMZ has learned multiple sources connected with the iconic comedian and actor, most famous for his starring role in Danny, sorry, in Danny Turner's Danny Tanner's Full House tells us he passed away Sunday at the Ritz Carlton in Orlando. The chef department and the fire department responded to the hotel at 4 p.m. ET after hotel security had found Bob in his room. We're told he was pronounced dead on the scene, but the circumstances of his death are still unclear. Um, Bob's been touring the country lately, hitting a number of destinations throughout the state of Florida, including Orlando, which he started in September and was supposed to take him through to May. Jesus. On Saturday night, he was in Jacksonville doing a show at the Ponte Verde Concert Hall, where he actually shouted out the crowd early Sunday morning. And this is the, yeah, this is the post I saw like live when he actually posted it. He says, um, Love tonight's show at the PEV Concert Hall at Jacksonville. Appreciative audience. Thanks again to Real Tim Wilkins. Sorry, Real Tim Wilkins for opening. I had no idea I did two hour set tonight. I'm happily addicted again to the shit. I can only imagine what people who are actually at the show must feel like. People that are working doing people that had plans to hang out, go to dinner or whatnot. Just waking up and just, you know, finding God almighty. Um the tragic thing is I'm I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, um Bob Saget was pretty close with Norm McDonald. Um, again, I'm, I'm just reading into nothing. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, whether he was still really upset and kind of distraught about Norm's untimely passing, a passing that no one actually knew about because he kind of kept his illness secret and private to himself. But damn it, man. R.I.P. Bob Saget. Saget wrote, da, 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 da. Saget played the patriarch in the hit ABC sitcom for almost 10 years. Landing the lead star role in 1987, um, finishing out his first iteration in 1995. Opposite stars John Stamos, Dave Collier, of course, not to mention his TV daughters, Candice Cameron, Jodie Sweetin as Mary Kate, and Olsen, who swapped the duties of portraying Michelle. While his turn as a quintessential family man um, is what a lot of people remember him before, truth is, Saga is a pretty raunchy guy, especially in his stand up comedy. Um, Bob Saga's comedy contributions were put on full display on his memorable, mem memorable comedy roast, um, sorry, Comedy Central roast, where a ton of his lifetime, long time friends and buddies taught him a new one, Killingly and Love. Yeah, that was one of the best ones, actually. Good, good, that's good that they mentioned that. Um, he proved to be a good sport, taking shots from the likes of Gilbert Gottfried, Norm MacDonald. Greg Girardo, legends in it. Damn man, two of them already gone. John Lovitz, Jeff Ross, and R Brian Poston. Um, he even had some jokes of his own to fire off, making perhaps one of the most memorable roasts in Comedy Central's vote, speaking to Saga's influence on the craft. Um, in addition to his stand-up and Full House fame, Saga will also be remembered as a fan, as a fan favorite on America's Funniest Home Videos, of which he served as host from 1987 to 1997. <clears throat> running con currently on this time and tone of fh speaking of mr tanner he reprised his role as netflix reboot on the franchise fuller house which ran for four years ended in 2020 yo bob saga must have been paid bro he was the host of american's funniest home videos from 1989 to 1997 that was back when tv was paying bucks as well right and everybody was watching it because there wasn't we didn't have they didn't have smartphones back then right or like phones you could watch stuff on so people's attention or saturday nights were basically spent in front of the tv so if you're hosting something around that era people know who you are so you're legit famous not like famous people you know nowadays where everyone's got a high amount of instagram followers but you no idea who they are uh, because it's, it's the fame sounds more segmented you're kind of famous in your own little niche whereas back then bob saga was like a legit household name like when they say household name he is legit household name like he run his name definitely rung off which definitely explains you know why he was so jovial all the time and always smiling because he's so paid up man um yeah, R.I.P. to the legend. Bob's other notable acting credits included a recurring role in Entourage, in which he played a zany version of himself and narrated his voice. Oh, yeah, true, he's in Entourage, I forgot about that. Another sitcom he starred in um, called Raising Dad, one of the Penguins. In the face of Penguins, the lead in Surviving Serbia, and the standout cameo in Half Baked as a recovering crackhead, among and many, many other appearances on film. Lately, he's been getting back to the roots of the podcast series called Bob Saga's Here For You. Really good as well, podcast series. I think he started it, if I'm not mistaken, during COVID or during the lockdowns. Um, it's always, always it's always over Zoom, but because he's such a nice dude, it sort of works. Um, they kind of bounce off each other. There was a recent one he did with Bill Bird that was really funny. 
but most of them are really good even if you don't know who the guests are he's, he has a good way of kind of interviewing and being a good conversationalist um so definitely recommend you check that out to kind of you know honor his legacy or honor his memory sorry um and he even featured on one of the celebrity guests of the mass singer not too long ago the last time he we got we got out what well, sorry the last time we got him out was in a late 2019 when he was hanging out with his fans and perhaps outside of craigs in west hollywood while also taking photos and signing autographs we wish ross happy jeff ross, he wished jeff ross happy birthday on the on the 31st and seemed to be in really good spirits bobby survived by his wife kelly rizzo and three children r.i.p man this is legitimately one of the most touching and actual nice you know um RIP post I've seen from TSD, so you could tell he was a legitimately nice dude, or the person writing it, I was actually a fan. So that's nice to see they didn't, you know, do him a disservice. Um, and then they said here, the the update so far has been the Orange County Sheriff's Office tells us we have no information on the cause of death and detectives have found no signs of foul play or drug use in this case. The medical examiner's officer will, will make a final call. Another bog button, another update here says Bob's longtime friend and co-star John Stamos just tweeted the following. I am broken. I am gutted. I am in complete utter shock. I will never ever have another friend like him. I love you so much, Bobby. And yeah, man, I don't think it's even bothering to, I don't, you know, anyone bothering to entertain what the cause of death is, like, you know, mind your business, don't be a cunt, um, just, you know, remember his um, memory, and yeah, man, remember all the good times, and obviously rewatch content, rewatch stand-up specials, rewatch, of course, series he was in, podcasts and whatnot, because yeah, definitely one of the good ones. And it always happens that way, isn't it? We always lose the flipping good ones first, and the absolute douchebags who, you know, probably do more damage than good still hang around life is just cruel like that but again r.i.p to um bob saget um force and feelings go out to his family and close friends during this really tough time especially just after christmas after the new year you know new lease of life trying to get your plans that you want to put in place and stuff and then boom i have no way this happened so yeah r.i.p bob saget man absolute absolute legend um moving on quickly uh i wanted to mention this i thought I wonder if some of you guys have been thinking about this too. When do you think we will get back to normal? And when I mean normal, I mean like proper normal. What you were doing this time, let's say January in 2019, when will we get back to doing that? Or 2018 even? When do you think that will happen? Like genuinely. Because I'm looking at, um, I've been watching this series called Station Eleven, which is essentially you know kind of mirroring what's going on now with covid but essentially this this flu in this series is more deadly that like people legitimately die and there's only a few what thousand people left on the earth or what it seems like a few thousand people um for some reason infrastructures of all kind of everything's finished like it's just people living in desolate parts of america living in cabins um you know living out in the wilderness um you know whatever and obviously it's a tv series it's not real life but they they do kind of give you the impression it it's more so like um how they're going to survive this as opposed to will life ever return back to normal and it seems like on the series they've kind of just settled into the fact that this is their new reality and it's just kind of making do with it and they're doing the thing that i like in terms of my philosophy or kind of outlook in life where i'm more of a guy that tries to operate in the world as is as opposed to wishing for the world to kind of bend to my wheels right and wants or whatnot that's just going to set you off a failure disappointment depression all that good stuff i'm just going to operate in the world as it is and make do with the best i can and obviously we're doing that now at the moment right we're kind of doing that but i also feel like there's a little element in the air at the moment where some people are just i wouldn't say giving up but they've just re resigned themselves to whatever reality this is not in a give up way, just more so in a like, what else can I do way? You know, like if you're like um, about to board a plane or something, right? And you're in the non kind of registered queue thing, right? Because there's obviously if you're in coach, there's still different queues. So there's a queue where you register and there's a queue where you don't register for your ticket and you just get a randomly allocated one. It doesn't matter if you want to rush or not. The ones that registered or bought their, their seat, their ones are still going to go through still first. And then all you guys left over that didn't re that didn't want to buy your seat and just got randomly allocated one will have to wait until they're in. So it's not like you give up in terms of like rushing. You're just going to be like, okay, I'm just going to get on whenever I, I get on. 
and it kind of happens the same maybe the better example is in a kind of immigration queue if you're just late for your train or you're late sorry for your airplane and you know you can't barge in front of everybody because everybody else is late too you just have to kind of accept the situation you're in and hope that by the time you you're kind of done with the immigration you're going to get on your plane in time or by the time you're gone for secure you're going to get your plane in time and i feel like people are in the same sort of sort of um vibe now people i don't know i just get the impression people have kind of just resign themselves to whatever we're living in now and i'm really questioning to myself like trying to put a number put a date to it like when do i think this is gonna go back to normal like when am i gonna do the things that i was doing in february 2019 like you know whatever when's that gonna happen or january 2020 when's it gonna happen and my initial guess would be most likely especially considering what's happening um because unfortunately we are a somewhat global citizens right we don't operate in silos even if you do live in australia new zealand you live in parts of china you're still going to be affected by the you know whatever covid decide, decides to do in western europe or central europe or wherever it may be or the western hemisphere so we don't operate in silos so life can't get back to normal until everybody gets back to normal so if that's the case right and this is a mad thing to say <laughs> really is a mad thing to say but i'm gonna say another five years I say another five years before we're back to normal. Like we're legitimately normal. Like no restrictions. You don't have to go on your government's website to go and check if you can go to this place for a holiday. You just did what you did before in 2019 where you just went online, you booked a plane ticket, you booked a whatever train ticket if you're somebody landlocked and you just went. There was no going on the government's website, downloading stuff, put stuff up your nose, putting in an envelope. That didn't exist. If that's to happen, I'm saying five years. Five years. I give it five, which takes us into, you know, some scary territory because obviously there's no guarantee that the five years will be a smooth ride. Other things might happen in the interim as well or during, you know, along the way that might end up extending that time. But I think five years, which would be what, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, let's say 26, 27. <laughs> 2000 and 27 most likely that's when we're going to go back to some level of normality crazy man and the craziest thing too also you don't really hear people talking about it in the news i guess because it's not the most you know um it's maybe not constructive it's just serves no purpose to talk about it in the news because you don't know but you don't really hear a conversation around when they're trying or aiming to kind of live in a place where we may be living with the virus or we may be decided we should just kind of you know collectively decided as a world population that we should just kind of continue with our everyday lives and take what precautions we can but all this other stuff is a nonsense i don't know i think five years man it's really really bleak to say but i honestly think five years so if you have any predictions or when you think life will get back to some semblance of normal and you're watching this on youtube and definitely send me a um leave a comment down below and if you're listening via the podcast app i'll put like an email link on there too and send me an email let me know what's your guess what guesses what what guess do you have when do you honestly think life will return back to normal like it was in 2019 and i say 2019 because that's when i didn't know covid was happening i think by you know by the end yeah by 2020 uh, we already all had a, a, an idea we saw some news clips we saw those kind of viral images of people in china getting boarded up in their house you know like crazy shit like we saw that's happening we saw the bodies in italy and whatnot piled up because all the mugs are full but 2019, everyone was oblivious. We were all living in Lapland and, you know, having a whale of a time whilst the flipping volcano was slowly but surely erupting. So, yeah, five years, I think, in terms of getting back to normal. But if you guys are more optimistic than I am, then please let me know in the comments. I would love, 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 love to hear um, what you think about this. Actually, I really would. Um, next on the list, I want to talk about this. It's kind of crazy because, you know, for a lame brain guy like myself who doesn't really get these kind of things because obviously it's not something that would ever kind of pass my mind um, because I'm not an absolute monster. But this crazy news came out today regarding Trey Songs, who I'm a big fan of because I'm a big R&B head. And um, yeah, man, very, very concerning. So this is a headline courtesy of TMZ. Trey Songs denies rape allegations made by Dylan Gonzalez. You never want to see your name alongside that word. And you never want to see allegation because unfortunately in this era, if somebody accuses you of such a heinous crime, there's going to be a population of people out there who no matter how much you disproved it will always believe you're that guy. And it's a smudge, I think, for the most part that doesn't lead. I think it's a smudge for the most part that seems like 
it's even got worse sort of societal consequences than murder for some reason, which is strange isn't it, if you think about it. You could end somebody's life, but you could possibly rebuild your life in terms of how you're received by the public. But if you're convicted or if you're even accused of the R word, there's no coming back for you. Society kind of just rids you forever. And I think that's a real big um, change in society overall because there was a time back in the day where some people would say if a woman got, you know, R-worded, oh, she deserved it. She was asking for it. What were you wearing? Which way did you go? I remember that being a little bit of the discourse back in the day when I used to watch a show called Crime Watch. You know, you came to the show called Crime Watch, which basically was essentially like a, a compilation show of all the most deadliest, heinous, flipping murders and kidnappings or whatnot, assaults happened in the UK. Pretty, pretty bleak thing to watch. But before, back in the day, it used to be a thing you'd rush home to watch with your parents and stuff, and it didn't really make any sense. After a while, you kind of snap out of it. Like, hold on, why am I, why am I kind of um watching this miserable? And again, the acting was really good. They'd really try and get across the emotion of the of the, what happened. I remember one specific one I remember watching of um this couple i think it was in england somewhere maybe it was in middle uh maybe middle england north i don't know somewhere in the countryside where this couple were walking through a field or whatever going on a hike and uh, you know the rapist came and essentially somehow i don't know what happened in the altercation he managed to hog tie both of these people on the floor and essentially outwarded the part the woman right next to the guy and at the same time he was doing, I think he was holding a knife to the guy's throat. There's just some, some incredibly sick thing. I remember re reading, I think it was a big story around the time in the UK. So if you can find it yourself, definitely check it out. But it was a crazy, crazy story. And those are the things I used to subject myself to again and again and again on purpose. I didn't understand it. But again, you know, you, you grow up, you get a bit older and you start to realise, you know, what you, what, what you, what you listen to and what you see, um, definitely plays a big part in how you kind of view the world and your emotions and all that. It just wasn't constructive. But anyway, that being said, um, it just, it's a nutty thing, isn't it? It's really a nutty thing to think about. Like, you could take somebody's life and society could somewhat forgive you. But if you do R word somebody or you're accused of it, it's basically lights out for you. Especially if you're a public person, um, you know, it's very difficult to come back off that. You can come back off it, don't get me wrong. People say come back because, you know, people say counterculture doesn't exist. In that aspect, I understand what, what they mean because essentially if you get accused of something and you're a celebrity, it's not like you're going to, next day you're going to be working in Tesco. That's not going to happen. You're always going to have your, your kind of bottoms always going to be a lot higher than most people's bottoms. But in terms of you ever reaching your heady heights that you were previously, that's completely done. So there is some sort of societal consequences even if maybe the justice system doesn't work that way because you know rapes are notorious or our words i'll keep a mess up i don't want to get demonetized but our words are notoriously hard to convict um for a whole bevy of reasons um but yeah this is a mad one and again mad again for me in my head again being a simple-minded bloke because i think to myself if i was a dude and i looked like trey songs the last thing I'd be want to be doing is this, right? I'd go out of my way to be actually a flipping Superman gentleman, right? I'd be like turbo gentleman. I'd be uh, amazingly chivalrous and stuff because you've already been blessed with the genetic lottery in terms of looking the way he does and maybe appealing to a wide breadth of women. Why would you then take the piss out of that kind of blessing? Why not just kind of use it as a platform to just be a nicer dude? You know what I mean? And imagine having such a good reputation amongst all these women now who are trying to get with you and they're just spreading all this good word about you. They're basically acting as if you're acting as your street team by saying, oh my God, you're so nice. He got me a cab home. Um, he let me stay over the night. He cooked me bread, like whatever, right? They just like give you such a good review because they think, oh, this guy's amazing. What a what an absolute refreshing um, hookup that was because this is one of the rare kind of hot dudes I've hooked up with that wasn't a meathead and was also had great conversational skills, was a pleasure to be around and just was, you know, a, a gentleman throughout that would be an actual bigger win all right and guys like myself would hate you forever because you'd got everything you got the looks and you also got the personality it'd be like damn it but also on the flip side of things i could also understand why it would also happen because in some way shape or form if you've got if you've been blessed with genetic lottery as trey songs as or people that look like him or of that kind of ilk or that kind of level of attractiveness there is a thinking out there that you have all the access because everyone comes to you. You don't have to go and seek anybody out. People in your DMs, they're trying to get all over you when you're out and about. They're screaming your name at shows. You have everything coming towards you. So when that happens, sometimes you can take liberties. 
And sometimes it can get too easy where you just start to want to play risky games and start to do things that you probably maybe wouldn't have done prior. But because it's always coming at you at a plate, you start to take it for granted. And then maybe latent thoughts of whatever you had in you from back in the day start to bubble up and then you turn to a monster. Or you just always was that monster and we never knew because you're really famous and you're always well liked. So people, again, made excuses for you or maybe buried evidence or pay people up because that happens also behind the scenes. But maddening story, maddening story. And again, like if he's not, if he's not guilty, trying to, again, you know, trying to rid yourself of that smudge is near and impossible. It says the following uh, via TMZ, Trey Songz is denying allegations he raped a woman in Sin City Hotel with his team telling us that he'll be exonerated after legal process plays out. Hmm. Here's a deal. Artist Dylan Rodriguez, sorry, Dylan Gonzalez is accusing Trey of raping her in what she calls a well-known Las Vegas hotel and says she's weighing her legal options. A source close to Dylan says, um, tells us the incident happened several years ago. Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Several years ago to report an R word. How does that happen, though? Because I guess... <sighs> I guess with most crimes, you have to prove it happened, right? Is that it? Or prove intent? No, you have to prove it actually happened. Because then it would just be a he said, he said. So if it's over seven years, how do you prove categorically that this happened? And also prove that it wasn't consensual. Do you know what I mean? That's always a difficult thing, I think. And it, it, I just wish there was a better way that um, women or people in general could record our words. Like, there must be a better way there must be some sort of change that can happen in law and i know of course maybe numbers wise our words are really rare and they probably don't happen too often um you're probably most likely to win the lottery then yeah i know people can say what they want to say but there should be a way where people don't feel as if they have to bottle up such allegations or you know such charges for like seven or so years because they were afraid or maybe several years i don't know how long it's several it might be seven it might be four it might be two um, I think a lot of that plays into people's decision not to go and say anything or not to go report it. And unfortunately, in this situation, I think, especially if you're a survivor, somewhat a survivor, and you're kind of functioning and you're doing okay, I think you owe it to the other women out there or other men who might be victims of the said person to come out and say something. Um, it's not much. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be um, judicial, you know, consequences for said person when you say something because you're just saying something on instagram but it will do at least one thing in terms of maybe putting the brakes on anything that was going to happen warning other people that were maybe going to jump in as well like all that stuff is super important i think it really really does need to be emphasized a lot um you know as much as it probably i would assume incredibly brutal and painful to maybe address and to even think about and to even kind of articulate what happened and you know because we have this weird thing as humans where we go through traumatic experiences we bury it right 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 deep down our psyche it goes right 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 to the back i know i do that quite often i put it in the back in the box in the safe in a well cover that well with concrete like i go hard when it comes to burying stuff so i can only imagine what happens to somebody like this um but yeah trey songs is denying it so let's see how it plays out it says the following but a rep for Trey tells TMZ they're using his name Trey as well, first name. You can tell they're pally pally with the rep in it. Um, Trey and his team are confident in the legal process and that there'll be an ex abundance of exonerated evidence um, to come over the next few weeks. Dylan's legal team attorney Ario Mitchell and Greg Vrabeck told TMZ they will consider pursuing any and all legal avenues and will take action in the next few weeks with plans to filing a civil suit. They do not mention anything about filing a police report criminal charges. And this is Dylan um gonzalez um post on instagram she says the following with what is was well, sorry with what seems like endlessly reoccurring news of the alleged sexual assaults committed by trey songs i am forced to repeatedly relive my mind and suffer anew the long suppressed horror and unbearable ptsd of my r word by his very hands at well-known los angeles sorry las vegas hotel i want to send my love strength and hope to all who are victims of sexual assault and fatal nature you are not alone I stand with you and encourage all of those who have suffered abuse to speak out and come forward. Suppression of our voices only emboldens our oppressors and you cannot heal what you do not reveal. At this time, I humbly request my privacy, consideration and compassion while I fully commit to pursue the best course of action and all of my legal options. Gracias mi gente de Dylan Gonzalez, I'm assuming. So brutal stuff. 
who again who knows what's true they have to let it play out in the courts of course um but yeah it's just a bad way to start the year in it if you're trey and of course if you're the lady too having to relive this in public especially considering how fanatical trey songs fans are i'm assuming her mentions aren't going to be too nice um just a sad situation for all involved hopefully it gets sorted out and hopefully whoever's guilty of whatever um gets duly punished and um if it is trey gets buried under a prison you know that's what should be happening really that's what should be happening um next we're going to quickly talk about or wrap up this story because it's been rumbling on and on and on which is a bit of a non-story but you know i think it's a slow news day and people are just a bit stressed out about life and whatnot obviously i covered molly may on here before somebody who had no idea who that person was before the lockdown again spending too much time at home has made me spend too much time on my phone i'm sure most of you guys and girls out there i've done the same thing i'm always glued to my phone now i'm always on social media always checking my feed and i get to see way more stuff than i did prior because i was always out and about and I just generally had a bit of a detached relationship from my phone but now throughout the pandemic even until now i'm just on it too much i think even the other day when i got my report in terms of my screen time it was crazy high number so i've kind of decided to give instagram a break I'm still probably on Twitter too much, but in terms of all other social media, I'm just kind of hanging back and just trying to get my life right and obviously read some books in terms of entertain myself that way. But in that time, I found out who Molly May was. I found out a bit about her. I found out how people seem to like her on, online and so especially on the, the, the kind of social media, Instagram blogs that I checked that are mostly kind of uh, marketed towards the black community as opposed to the white community. But in general, I think in the UK, when it comes to celebrity sort of life, it all kind of meshes and melds in together because everyone watches the same reality tv shows they follow the same music it's all kind of the same sort of thing anyway um this lady she's 22 years old she's you know really rich really famous people seem to think she's hot i'm not really the biggest fan but whatever um she's smashing it. she's doing really well for herself and she went on a podcast to have an interview with this other entrepreneur guy she spoke about her struggle her ups and downs her story you know this typical entrepreneur thing and in some way in the interview she mentioned about how she you know her work ethic and not having friends and i think i mentioned it already in the podcast right how she you know to be as as well off as she is you can't really have a social life and all these sort of things that you'd think are common sense and then she dropped this one little nugget where she's like oh um i think everyone has the ability to do what i do you just have to commit you know a hundred percent and we've all got the same 24 hours in a day to do something you just have to work really hard and for whatever reason saying to people that they had the same 24 hours as everybody else triggered the entire internet and people just started spazzing out going crazy you know writing dissertations talking about how influencing is you know fundamentally racist which i can't really get my head around wrapped around in but i'm really grateful for my twitter feed because i do follow a lot of people who i think you know talk a lot of rubbish but they also present a different perspective in terms of societal or cultural conversation pieces right and i can kind of tell, sometimes see the, the opposite side i can hear what the opposite side are thinking instead of making up the argument in my head i can actually hear what they're saying and it's interesting very very interesting but incredibly um, off the mark for me because I don't think there's anything racist about influencing I don't think what she said was was wrong maybe it was distasteful maybe it was ill-advised maybe she didn't quote-unquote read the room but I don't think there's anything wrong with sharing you know your experience and also sharing anecdotal evidence that hey I think I was a nobody and I was one of many other blonde blue-eyed girls in this country but somehow I think the reason why I got here is because of my hard work now of course it's more layered than that we know that but it wasn't a bad thing to say People rumbled on, people got annoyed, and now the final chapter of it is that she finally put out a statement via Instagram where she kind of, you know, apologizes, I guess, to some extent, or tries to explain herself. And it says the following here. I went to come back online today as normal, but I feel like before I do that, I just wanted to say this. When I was when I say or post anything online, it is never with malice or ill intent. I completely appreciate that things can affect people differently in different ways. However, I just want to stress that I would never intend to hurt or upset anyone by anything that I have to say or do. Imagine having to apologize. This is the sucky thing about being an influencer or being somebody else well known. Number one, when you talk, you have to always have disclaimers at the beginning or at the end of what you're saying or anything in the middle. 
that's what basically fucked her up, right? Because she didn't have a disclaimer. She didn't say, well, hey, I'm not talking about people who obviously have, you know, don't have the means to kind of focus on their side hustle. I'm not talking about people who are single parents. I'm talking about people who are not able-bodied. She has, she has, that's what she had wanted people, that's what people wanted her to do. They wanted her to do that kind of disclaimer dance and then give her opinion. If you just give your opinion based on your evidence or based on your kind of anecdotal experience or basically based on your life experiences or whatever it may be, people suddenly get all, all the niggas and twists because they think you're immediately writing off a, a you know huge parts of the population when it's like it's not that serious really in it i'm just talking about me because the person's asking about me um it continues here it says i apologize to the people that have been <laughs> affected negatively or misunderstood um the meaning of what i had to say on the podcast the intention of the podcast were only ever to tell my story and inspire from my own experience love you all always the love you all thing is weird as all people saying love you and you don't whatever but that's the bad thing about getting into being an influencer you're always kind of um you're as much as you can exploit your fans to make a lot of money look what the Kardashians do it's also on a knife edge because they can decide whether or not you have a career or not it's really odd right it's that kind of balance but then also if you get in trouble you have to kind of get up in front of the flipping you know in front of the whole town and basically sing for your supper and apologize that's the only kind of demeaning part of it i would feel like like why am i apologizing for something that i generally think i didn't do anything wrong but if you want these people to keep following you and to buy your overpriced lipstick and to buy your collaborations with whatever whatever it may be or to give a fuck that you're engaged or not engaged i mean if you want that to happen you have to apologize you kind of have to quote unquote bend the knee and that must be one of the most in, in you know annoying things that have ever existed in the history of the world um i think someone it's a good it's a clip the next slide and we end it there no, it's not the clip. Okay, it doesn't matter. But you, you know what the clip is. You, you know what she said. It is what it is. Um, I think it was a nonsense issue. Having to apologize or something like that is flipping nutty. But we're living in nutty times in it, so I shouldn't have expected anything different than that. Um, there is some slight. I remember at the beginning of the show that how I'm not feeling the most positive about this year when it comes to the pandemic, and I'm thinking about when this things are going when things are will return back to normal i mentioned on the show that i think normality will return in five years maybe more in terms of how we were living in 2019 when would that happen again i say in five years but well, there are some good signs that maybe life might return to normal quote unquote sooner than that because people's usually their actions usually kind of press uh proceed or proceed whatever that word is um good things right or things that might happen in the future so if people are usually booking holidays usually it's a sign that you know people are feeling a lot more safe to go out because that's the other thing that people don't realize too even though the world is quote unquote somewhat open in some places people's fear of covid and contracting it and maybe because they've got you know uh pre-existing health conditions whatever it may be or just general people just generally fearful or maybe you have changed their habits and changed their lifestyle choices all those things are impacting how the world is basically looking at the moment it's not just all about the virus it's not just all about the vaccine or being anti-vax some people have been um fundamentally hardwired no fundamentally changed um throughout this um pandemic era that we're living in through lockdowns and whatnot they've just changed as as people so to expect those same people that were going to you know india to do backpacking and parts of southeast asia or who are kind of moving their entire family and up in sticks and living in austria to expect them to just kind of continue on and doing that thing is really um short-sighted because everyone's got different ideas of what their life's going to look like now in this kind of um post-pandemic world but anyway, it's a good article because the telegraph says holiday bookings surge as demand returns for pre-pandemic levels it says here um the da, 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 britons are rushing to book holidays as testing requirements for fully vaccinated travelers ease with demand to close um to rent to turning to pre-pandemic levels of some operators following wednesday's announcement travel firms are reporting a long-awaited surge in demand among them is operator blue blue bay travel who has experienced its busiest day in trading in over a year the quote yesterday was our busiest day in terms of website traffic and booking inquiries in over a year the volume of inquiries required yesterday matched out matched out to january 2020 wow mad daily levels which is something we couldn't have managed a month ago when these testing um, rules came in the consumer confidence plummeted um, jet to holiday also confirmed um, that booking had increased by 150 percent um, day on day he says we've been 
sorry, we've seen in the media and dramatic spike in bookings with volume since the government announcement of heading towards a pre-pandemic levels. Both Travel Bug and Travel Republic also have reported spikes in bookings, especially for popular winter to some destinations like Dubai and Maldives. Yeah, Dubai has been the fucking destination to be in it. Dubai is turning into the UK version of Cancun. Like the amount of people that have been going there over the last few months or maybe year, especially during the pandemic, has been insane because I guess Dubai has been fairly open for the majority of lockdown. So if you had the funds and the availability to go, you could basically go and suspend belief, right? Suspend reality and eat at a restaurant, go to a club, smoke some cheese to hang out, you know, do the things you can't do here in the UK. Um, I don't know anything about the Maldives though, but yeah, the, Dubai has been really popular with people from the UK. It continues, says skiers are seizing the opportunity to book a last minute trip too. Ski instructor marketplace Maison Sport has reported a 100% increase in bookings overnight. Doesn't Maison Sport sound incredibly Caucasian? Is it me? Whenever I think of, whenever, no, I don't think of skiing, but when I saw that name, and the, the thing that struck me the most is like a whole cast full of flipping people from um, succession or something. Do you know what I mean? Just incredibly um, Caucasian, incredibly um, sheltered, and, you know, aware of life um, with no sense of self awareness whatsoever. Like, that's why I don't know why it just jumped out at me that when I saw that Maison Sports, like, wow, that sounds white as hell, isn't it? Anyway, continue. All bought by Fresh Snowfall in the Europe's top ski resorts. Um, the quote says as follows search levels which were already up in a weekend continue to increase and with great snow conditions and plenty of excellent value deals still available now is the time to book said chris langhan the managing director of crystal ski holiday so there is some light in the tunnel things look like they're somewhat improving but i don't know i'll believe it when i see it you know what i mean i'll believe it when i see it Next on the list, we have this interesting, 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 interesting. Come on, can you load, please, if you don't mind? Bada bean, bada boom, bada bean, bada boom, bada bean, bada boom. What is this? Is that me? Boom. Okay, another one on my feet on my laptop popped off again. Or oh, maybe it's this. Oh no, it's that, isn't it? It's this. Oops. Yeah, my computer is not really loading too quickly today, is it? What's happening now? I don't know. I hope it's loading. Okay. For every reason, this comp. Oh, I did, I did actually find out what computer I'm going to get, if you're wondering. So I'm going to I'm gonna obviously segment my computer usage. I've managed to buy some bits and bobs, like a hard drive and RAM and a new battery and a charger for this MacBook here, which is the 20... 12 macbook pro and as you can see here if you're not watching a bit of podcast i'm basically holding this massive macbook 13 inch so it's, big, it's a big daddy still but the one with the cd drive here right that's the one i've got and i remember buying this brand no maybe refurbished from amazon in like 2014 so i've had this for a while and this this computer saved me man this was the one where i edited my pictures on i ripped my blog on i um recorded my first dj mixes and stuff all on this flipping laptop so it's kind of served me really really well but over the time because i had this a kind of normal hhd yeah a normal hard drive in it um obviously not the quick the quicker solid state ones and it kind of failed a couple of times i think maybe i overloaded it because it had a small amount of memory but now i've got this one terabyte hard drive coming in so i'm going to obviously get this up and running and then the second thing i'm going to go buy is a lenovo legion 5 laptop which is essentially a streaming laptop and again i'm only buying laptops because i have space to have a, a proper pc hopefully when i decide to move to another location i'll be able to have the space necessary to buy a pc that I can actually have its designated place but because i'm going to move around my stations a lot it's good to have something i can just portable that can carry with me and of course if i go and do a stream at pirate studios i've got something that i could use so the streaming laptop i'm going to buy is the lenovo legion 5 that's my one i'm kind of going for now probably going to get the one with the intel chip um it's a beefy one it looks really good and it's going to fit all my needs it's going to be able to stream really well i can use a monitor whatnot i can just stream it on a laptop so I'm, I'm just looking forward to being able to use a proper pc to obviously stream because so far my laptop has just been a struggle if you've been on my random show live streams you know how hard it's been over the last couple of months to get it going i've scheduled so many live streams that i couldn't end up getting to work because the testing just was buffering and you know lagging too much and i've tried many many things i've tried to switch the process sorry the 
um, the presets to hardware um, in terms of the graphics card it just doesn't work as well. You know what I mean, it is, it is what it is. So now I'm going to obviously do what everyone else does and obviously get a PC to stream because it's the best thing to do. And you know, it's got you know the the, the, the GPU will be able to handle that a lot better, especially because my internet is fairly decent where I live. Even though I live in an apartment, so it still works pretty fine. So that should be okay. So I'm looking forward to that to get an upgrade, but um yeah it's gonna be nice to have actually have a couple of computers right so i can kind of segment what i do so i'm not just overloading it on all because like i said the one i'm using now this macbook air i've got photoshop on it i'm running garage band i've got tractor um i've got flipping record box i've got virtual dj i've got imovie do you know what i mean i've got all those apps and photoshop and i'm pushing it super hard and just can't handle it so hopefully once I get all those things sorted out, I'll be back on where I need to go in terms of having loads of different units I can use. And again, someone like myself, who's being as creative as I am and doing a lot of work, I need to have different things I can use for different things. You know, I basically need the tools in order to get do, um, in order to kind of express myself, if you get what I mean. But yeah, anyway, moving on. There's this really art good, really good article that I read recently, courtesy of Resident Advisor, titled the following, Reflections... Uh, so reflect uh, the reflections of the pandemic nightlife or something i don't know why it doesn't okay there we go the title there um 2021 reflections the hidden cost of pandemic era nightlife and it was a really good into so a really good article because it touched upon a lot of the things that i've been thinking about and it also gives you a kind of a glimpse into what it must feel like to kind of go through the pandemic as a professional kind of musician or artist or dj right because it's obviously a bit of a it's a bit of a moonshot to have that kind of career because obviously it's a career that everyone wants it's a very in-demand job and there's not a lot of you know uh places for you to go where you can kind of get paid to do the job or you know there's not a lot of spaces for you to go and get paid or you be professional so you spend a lot of time doing it for free doing it out of pocket and then you finally do end up becoming somewhat successful you're probably a lot mature in your age. You're not super young. With some exceptions, there are some people that make it when they're 18. But for the most part, you make it, you know, you make it when you're meant to make it. But when you do make it, you kind of, you, you shouldn't, no one could blame you for thinking, oh, finally, I've got here and kind of rest up. I'm not going to be able to, you know, I won't need to go work in an office job anymore. You kind of decide, okay, this is my gig. No one's going to blame you for thinking that. And then out of nowhere, of course, a pandemic happens and all your plans and, your kind of hopes are completely get dashed out the window and the career that you just got settled into that you've been hustling and and trying for your entire life to make it now gets completely pulled away from you and there's no indication of when you're ever going to get it back and if you're ever going to get it back in a state that you had it in the first place that's the brutal part of it because it's one thing getting your career back but then getting it back and it doesn't look like anything you did previously that must hurt too and then of course it must be it must be um hard to kind of uh rationalize in your head because in some respects you know you're grateful because you know you have friends who are legitimately on the breadline who are having to go to like food shelters and whatnot um who have maybe had to move back in with their parents but still for you because you used to play 50 gigs a, a month and now you're down to 25 you can be excused for still feeling a little bit torn up and still wondering why and when am i ever going to get my job back when am i ever going to get my dream back or my dream job back and this kind of article i think kind of gives you a good insight into it and i'm going to read a bit of it for you now it says as follows at my first party in 2021 i remember surveying the sprawl of the people or rather the limbs before me thrashing around with feral muscular intensity their grippling hands the sweat matted hair and the contorted faces presented the primary emotion we all felt over the year of sensory deprivation instantainable inst ins incest instant why can't i say that word instatiable hunger <laughs> for almost two years our worlds have been compacted into our bedrooms or flat shares leaving us greedy for the expansion and expression of this summer's reopening we crave the anonymity of heaving um of a heaving crowd and the fated embrace of an alluring stranger and for good reason studies have shown that synchronized movement and the ecstatic joys of self-loss are key to human happiness which i definitely agree which again which explains why people were sort of like drawn to these play graves like a flipping moth to a flame do you know what i mean they couldn't keep their hands off it people were it seemed like people's first reaction when the pandemic first struck and it was red hot was to go and rave was to go and get drunk was to go and get high was to just go and just forget 
about the realities of life and now it's making a lot more sense at the time it seemed really selfish i think i reported on them a couple of times in my podcast about oh what's wrong with these people why can't they just stay at home blah, 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 blah. but if you think about it really it was just a primal reaction to such dread that was going on around around you so you're thinking to yourself you know what if we're all going to go out if we're so if we're all going to die i might as well die doing something that i actually enjoy as opposed to lying down in, in my bed under my duvet and i completely understand that and i think we all kind of sympathize with that now unless you're you know one of those crazy people that believes you know we should be under lockdown forever i think most people can kind of look at those play graves and kind of think you know what i get it I, again i wouldn't have gone I, I don't regret i didn't go but i get it um da, 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 da. Don't swap us and get the charger. Duh, 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 duh. Studies, yeah. Um, as social creatures, we thrive when um, merging with the collective. Part of the pleasure stems from our brain waves miraculously coping with those of our front and left neighbors when performing complex actions such as moving to a beat. Dance will facilitate this feeling of a collective coordination. Although 2021 heralded a longer way to return of events, the repercussions of 2020's emotional devastations continue. This October, researchers at the University of Queensland in Australia published a global report on COVID-19 impact on mental health. Using four year studies, they linked depression and anxiety disorders to COVID impact indicators in Western Europe. Again, North America and parts of Australia and Asia. Researchers found that these psychological disorders spiked more in the quarter, spiked more than a quarter in 2020 compared to the mental health predictions of pandemic free world and the disproportionately affected women and young people definitely definitely understand that one so it continues to have said Shub Sh Shubo star who's like a she seems like the the nice version of Peggy Goo right like the <laughs> the one that isn't gonna make her assistant drag her LV bags upstairs while she's on the phone to her mum or something do you know what I mean she just seems quite nice she's got a nice warm face anyway so Shubo Star says an, um, an artist and owner of Yuju Records or Yuju Ojo was diagnosed with panic disorder during the pandemic's first wave imagine that man to weather the financial strain of the lockdown she moved from her home base in Mexico City to her parents house in in Cheon Incheon, Incheon, a city one hour from Seoul, South Korea. Imagine that's what I'm saying. Have some, like maybe my sympathy is just far out reaching because I've been going through some emotional things myself. So when I do feel emotional for myself, I turn off my own kind of emotion and start to kind of reach out to other people who I don't know. So maybe this is part of it. But just imagine the emotional and mental turmoil you go through when you pursue your dreams you go and move to a completely different country in Mexico. Um, you maybe go there because you learned the language. Maybe you went there for love because you fell in love with some Mexican dude or something or girl. And now suddenly, because of a pandemic, you have to move back home to your parents, to a city or town one hour away from flipping Seoul, which you obviously escaped from because you thought as if maybe it was too small for you and your dreams are too big. And now suddenly you're back in this place reminding you, maybe have you failed? Maybe this is where you're meant to be. Imagine the questions that you're going to be saying. You're going to be, imagine the self-speak. Fuck me, man. Anyway, it continues a quote. My parents forced me to find another job. You gotta love Asian parents, and Asian parents are the same as black parents. There's no, there's no difference whatsoever there. <laughs> the, as if you could go back home and just be on the couch all day. It's not gonna happen. Um, my parents forced me to find another job to make money, and some Korean clubs offer me crazy cheap prices to play. That's gonna be brutal too. You're used to getting paid a grand for a gig, and now suddenly they're offering you to pay to pay for fifty. Before you made fifty work, and now uh, you know fifty sounds like they might as well give you two pounds. So that's gonna be brutal. I felt like my career disappeared. She told me, as someone who overly identified with her professional success, she, which she notes was was to her own detriment. The transition was harsh. She says, "I felt like I was losing myself after a few weeks. Of all of a sudden, I started to feel strange feelings, things such as the ground moving, my vision fading in and out again." These symptoms um, prompted her to seek out a psychiatrist who issued her with anxiety medication. God almighty. Imagine she had a way that she knew to... Imagine she had a way that she kind of hadn't really thought about to kind of have her anxiety under some sort of control. And then out of nowhere, because of the pandemic, it triggered it in a way that she never knew. And now you're having to take meds for it. Imagine the amount of people that we've lost and we, who didn't even have a chance to get meds. 
off the back of this like that's why i say lockdowns and war and whatnot are, are so much harmful than just people going out there living their lives and trying to be as careful as they can and obviously advising people who are at risk to take the vaccine the whole anti-vax thing is not even worth even talking about but if you just want to i just think the whole like completely locking down just doesn't work especially in the western world and again they've, they've, they've tried it in other countries they've tried it in places like australia and new zealand places that are legitimately on an island um and it still doesn't work so i can't imagine what the kind of thinking was behind doing it here especially in the uk where we had those dumb grades some certain places had could be you know freer than others and oh, i don't know it just encouraged people to be badly behaved and maybe take a train down to these places and then have parties just like oh it continues here it says approximately seven out of ten independent artists experience symptoms of anxiety and depression liquid panic attacks due to financial instability and fear of failure swedish digital distribution company record union found in 2019 report as the live music and entertainment industry experiences are in unprecedented period of volatility djs and producers in uh, in our world need more support than ever with venues reopening over the course of 2021, Superstar was able to gradually reduce her prescription. The most powerful antidote to anxiety was her ability to work. This is a big line. And it sounds very it sounds very Republican, actually. It sounds very conservative, very right wing. But actually, this is the truth. And I think a lot of people kind of saw that, especially especially for the I think especially more so people that did the whole like anti work movement thing if you really dig deep into that subreddit it's not about people wanting to be lazy it's about people not wanting to work you know dead end jobs that hardly pay them enough to pay their rent so the idea behind it is that hey why not have the government subsidize some of our salary similar to like a universal basic income or similar maybe to universal credit that we have here in the UK and then I can then go and do some part-time work in the field that I actually want to work in which will obviously then help the companies because they don't have to hire people full-time and then when they are coming in they're coming over with far more experience and maybe you know um, years in the game there may be somebody coming out fresh from uni Do you know what I mean it kind of serves everyone's purpose in that regard and that completely makes sense but at the crux of it, they just want to work doing something they actually enjoy as opposed to working in other sort of dead-end jobs. And um, yeah, after a long period of time, you heard people even in the state saying it, especially places that weren't maybe weren't coastal, that it was all well and good getting a stimulus check, but people were actually wanting to get back to work. They wanted to be back in bars, back in parks, back with friends, whatever. Whatever it constitutes being at work, that kind of community feel of maybe popping into the post office, all this sort of stuff. When you're living in a lockdown like with COVID, that doesn't exist anymore. You don't go on a post office run. You don't just pop into a supermarket to get this, to get that. You know what I mean? Your whole way of navigating around your little town changes completely. So definitely people associate work with some level of normality. That's kind of, you know what I mean? And now I think even we still got the stay at home orders here in the UK and stuff like people aren't even listening to that from what I've seen, especially when I go on my runs. People just generally just want to go to work just so they can have a change of scenery. So they're not just stuck indoors all day. So I think people underestimated, I think in general in the Western world, or the governments in general, I think they overestimated how much importance people actually put on their jobs and they underestimated how much jobs contribute to people's overall happiness and wellness when it comes to life. Because, you know, maybe you have, maybe all your friends in, in actual life are only at work. Maybe you don't have any other friends outside of that. Maybe the person that you're hooking up with lives is at work. Maybe you just have a good time being at work in general and you can kind of associate all these other things that you do outside of it, whether it's going to play football, hang out with you. Like, you know what I mean? There's, there's loads of things that kind of spawn off the fact that you're in, in and around the area that you're working or traveling home, bumping into a colleague you haven't seen in a long time. Uh, so I, I'm not surprised that that was, a, that was a really, really good line. It continues. Um, no, she said here, there's a quote here. She says, all the time I played, um, I literally said, da 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 yeah all the time i played i literally cried tears of joy that's just gratitude and not being back at home in it in, in this small town outside of korea with your parents forcing you to get a normal job or telling you to get back into medicine i can definitely feel that she continues her continues her article it says here for some individuals freedom from social restrictions was a saving grace for others it was a creator and you found complications caroline whiteley a berlin-based music journalist dj and resident at the munich's radio eight thousand or eighty thousand considered herself fortunate to have avoided the financial free for that plunged many artists during the pandemic or plagued sorry um, but her mental health also suffered in unexpected ways during the first parties of 2021 the self-described extravagant extrovert why am i keep messing up my words today um maybe it's dyslexia you never know you know maybe it's like un undescribed dyslexia or that was a thing called 
self described self diagnosed dyslexia um undiagnosed dyslexia maybe it might be um the self described extrovert abruptly found herself confronted with social anxiety a condition defined by a persistent intense fear of being judged by others that's mad in it to be somebody that's within just somebody that lives in berlin who's a music journalist and also you know has a show on a big Munich radio station to be diagnosed with social anxiety, that must be a mind fuck, isn't it? A condition defined uh, out of the out of practice from the party circuits, usual light hearted rapport, widely confessed she felt somewhat overwhelmed by seeing some people who were a regular part of my go going out life pre pandemic and wasn't sure at the moment how to act and be natural in the flow of the night. The pandemic, she continued, also coincided with a lot of personal and professional turmoil. So going out also meant running into people that I collaborated with and being confronted with the reality of everything that I went through. Yeah, having to bump into somebody that fired you before the pandemic because they can't afford furlough or whatnot or, to, you know, whatever, that must be a little bit hard to take. Um, but also, I definitely agree or kind of relate to feeling really awkward and not knowing what to do i think the first parties and raves that we went to they were really well organized yeah really well put together things mostly innovation type stuff and i wasn't the most i wasn't the best company let's just say that um i didn't really I'd, i never felt like i was in the groove i could never get high or drunk enough i was kind of playing catch up you know when like you're you know that dreaded thing that happens when you sometimes you used to be at work or you used to go to an actual office or an actual workplace and maybe you meet your friends after and then you're late or you're delayed and you get there and everyone's already been drinking they're already like three rounds in a couple of jokes maybe someone fell over you know what i mean like they're in a jovial mood and you have to play catch up and it never works. You can never catch up because their ambience and their vibe started from before they even got into the bar. And you just get in there thinking you just need to pour drinks down your gusset, down your sort of esophagus, and that's where you're going to get back on a level and it never does happen. And that's what happened to me the first few raves. I kept taking bump after bump, drink after drink, thinking, yeah, now I'm going to get back to the groove. And I took a pill, took this, and it didn't work. And I thought, you know what, by the end of it, I just stopped. I just thought, you know what, I'm just going to just have a drink and relax. I'm not going to try and chase this dragon anymore. Um, but it was very difficult to get into a smooth, the swing of things. So much so it made me question, am I falling out of love of going out? Da, 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 da. Obviously, I wasn't. I was just out of practice because I went from DJing f Saturday to Sunday, basically, most weekends. And then going out after my gig, so to finish, I'd go and play somewhere. If I finished at 1, 12, 11, I'd go out to another place, stay out until 6, do the same thing the next day and the next day, and then back to work on a Monday. I went from that to like nothing. Like everyone else did that to nothing, basically. So it's no surprise when I went to the first event, I wasn't even playing. I just an event I bought a ticket to to attend. I was like a little bit stiff. You know what I mean, I was like the old weird guy in the corner, just not knowing what to do. Should I bob my feet? Should I tap my foot? Should I move my shoulder or my elbow? I was really, really confused. Um, so I definitely, 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 definitely understand that one. Um, but yeah, definitely check it out. It's a long article. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I thought the opening bits were really um, interesting in terms of giving you an insight into what it must feel like if you're an actual DJ and you're going through something like that. And also it made me have a lot more sympathy and compassion for the tech house people out there, for the playground people out there that were just, you know, doing everything in their power to put a rave on, to go and DJ somewhere. It just seemed a bit insane to me in the beginning because I was like, hold on, no one else in music is being able to perform because if you're working in the music industry, unless, you know, maybe if you're an artist or you can sing or you can maybe up your streams and maybe do whatever, but for the most part, everyone relies on an audience and no one else could perform, but DJs felt like they had the right or they were entitled to have a career above anybody else like their job had to go on it must go on and um they went and played everywhere they played in you know middle of deserts like i saw that video of nina kravitz people dancing in hula hoops um you know good good jansen played some really weird social distance party too where he was in some plastic box and people were dancing in circles there was loads of quote-unquote open airs illegal raves but it just it just never stopped but i guess in terms of that kind of a primal response that kind of makes sense right people just wanted to escape the hellhole that they were going through on a daily basis and the only way to do it in the you know the, the way that we all know how to do it is just to get flat out drunk and high and what's the best place to get flat out drunk and high a nightclub especially when it's dark especially when everyone's going through what they've gone through and you're all kind of gone there and you're all kind of because i'd imagine those playgrounds as shit as they looked on the phone via those kind of clip channels and places and those instagram accounts i bet in real life they looked they were quite fun 
I bet they were fun. I bet they were quite fun to go to those playgrounds because everyone went there with a good attitude because they were so grateful to be going to a place where somebody was putting on some music and people were bobbing their feet and having a good time. I'm sure they were a good vibe. And I can only imagine for an artist if you had no ability to make any income and then suddenly somebody's DMing you and telling you do you want to play in this playground, you're going to go. Who cares if a couple of people make some dumb comments under your Instagram picture or i make a video on it who cares it's just noise just ignore it and it'll pass over a week anyway so i definitely understand why people took that risk um having read what i read because i can only imagine having to work so hard to get that sort of career that's very lucrative that everyone kind of wants super in demand and then choo, it gets pulled away from you it must be kind of a brutal pill to take so yeah definitely check it out i recommend it it's called um 2021 reflections the hidden cost of the pandemic era nightlife available on resident advisor check it out do not wait do not delay it's a very 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 interesting um what else do we have to talk about now let's move on from that one we saw that we saw this um but 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 what are we gonna talk about here the bittersweet we've seen that we've seen that we've seen this we've seen this we've seen that we've seen that yeah i think that might be it you know maybe that's it i think i finished i think i might be done i think i went through all my topics what else i've talked about here i think i might be done there boom bang bang yeah maybe that's it actually yeah let's leave it there and i'll do some more later but this has been the Xeno Zing Show episode number five three. I thought I had more topics to go through than this, but I think that might be it for now. Yeah. Again, I'm just thinking about when we're gonna get back to normal still. That's still in the front of my head, so please bear with me if that sounded a bit weird and sounded a bit rough. But yeah, here we are, chilling, trying to do the best we can with the time that we have available and making it work in any way and shape and form that we can. But yeah, this has been the Xeno Zing Show episode number five three eight thanks again for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your time if it's your first time check out the show via youtube you know what to do smash like hit subscribe leave a comment down below if you're listening via the podcast app then you know what to do on there too leave a five star review especially if you're listening via the spotify um app because that's where i want people to kind of leave reviews so i can get bumped up the algorithm so if you can do that then i'll be so grateful um so please do that if you can and then of course i'll see you guys again very very soon another episode's going to come probably what friday and then of course the bonus episode is going to come out on saturday so if you haven't subscribed to the patreon subscribe already at patreon.com for just agostino i want to get myself up to 100 by the end of the year that'll be sick if i get to 100 100 people um in the patreon supporting the guy paying for extra content listening to my recommendations on many many different things i'm going to start doing on there so ramp up the content maybe mix up a little bit more make it a lot more worthwhile make it a lot more worth your 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 shekels i'll do that on my end so if you can recommend it on your end then i'll be grateful a little bit of a deal there i i provide more content you recommend it to people you think might be interested and then we go from there in it but until then my friends it's been great speaking. It's been great hanging. Take care. If you listen via the audio podcast, you'll hear a good song. If you're just watching via YouTube, it'll just end right here. But until then, take care. Be safe, my friends. Peace. <laughs>